Hello. Welcome to number episode. <laughs> Welcome to episode number sixty-seven of CXO Talk. Yes, it's going to be one of those kind of shows. <laughs> I'm Michael Kaufman, and we're here with uh, my very friendly co-host Vala Afshar. Vala, very friendly. Michael, thank you. And a very giggling Nancy Duarte, <laughs> who is truly one of the top. Blank. Nancy, what are you one of the top? I was going to say your designer is too limiting, communications expert is too limiting. So, top I guess uh, I'm a bit of a communications theorist, I would say, an empathy architect. Maybe that would be the best thing to say. I like that. I, I like, like the that. empathy architect. You've uh, you've written books, and you are. I, I I love reading your Harvard Business Review blogs. Uh, one of my favorite TED Talks in terms of communication. And you describe your books as books for anyone who has ideas that they want to communicate. Can you talk a little bit about your books? Yeah, I would love to. So I've, I've written four. The first one I wrote was Slideology, because I thought the problem in communication was that people aren't required to take courses in how the visual display of information. So I thought, oh, let me teach them how to visually display the information. Well, then I was still sitting through really bad talks, um, and I realized it was a real content issue. And I wanted to be able to write a piece about how to resonate with the audience, because I got an F in that in college. I got an F in my speech communication class in connecting no with the audience. Yeah. So it was kind of a personal thing for me to write a piece about it. And then, um, then of course, Harvard Business Review calls, asks you you'd write a book, of course you do, and that's kind of a tips and tricks, um, and that's uh, Harvard Business Review as a persuasive uh, presentations guidebook. And then I just released one for free um, as an experiment in publishing called Slide Docs, and you can get it at slidedocs.com. And that one, I've kind of named the enemy. Uh, the enemy of a great presentation is we put too much stuff on a slide, yet three out of four slides have too much stuff on it. So it's clearly meeting a need in business. And so kind of named the enemy, called it a slide doc, and wrote best practices around how to create a slide doc, and that you need to distribute them instead of presenting them. So uh, that was my latest book. And then I have another uh, one in the hopper. You know, I have been reading and studying your work for a long time. And why is it that we put too much stuff on slides. Because <laughs> people use it as a teleprompter. I mean, it would be really awful to see, uh, you know, Obama turn his teleprompter screens around and let us read along. We'd be all like, "Come on, hurry up! I already know what you're gonna say." You know, where you you just don't do that. So one thing you could do if you really want a lot on your slides, you need to be teleprompted. Is turn the projection off behind you and just be teleprompted and have people listen to you. So we are relying on it. Another thing is business. Kind of when we're done with our talk, the first thing people say sometimes is, "Can you send me your slides?" So the slides do need to kind of travel without a presenter. So if you can circulate slides without a presenter and they're understood, you've created a slide doc. And, and that's great. You can create slide docs. But the minute you're asked to present the material in your slide doc, you need to back up, do a completely different creative process, and uh, create actually a cinematic story, which is a completely different process than pounding information into a slide doc. Wow. In your TED talk, you talked about structure to stories. Mm -hmm. and you talked about a three-act structure with the likable hero and roadblocks and how you emerge and transform. Then you mentioned a five-pyramid structure to stories. Mm -hmm. But then you talked about how you were able to identify shapes in great stories and great story storytellers, where you study Steve Jobs and, and Martin yeah. Luther King. Can you talk about how you discovered the shape of stories in, in terms of these great communicators. Yeah, I, you know, the greatest speeches over time have had a bit of a rhythm or a cadence, something that makes you stay riveted and relaxed, and then you're riveted and relaxed. And that's kind of this, it's story, basically. You build tension, and then you release it. And I knew it was in there. But it wasn't until I went through a two and a half year journey through story, where I looked at story patterns, story structures that make patterns. The greatest myths of all time are mythological structures in Eastern and Western story structure, story structure um, stories have a pattern. I thought, there's got to be a pattern that the greatest communicators used. So what they did is they started, they knew who they needed to communicate, they wrote, rewrote, crafted, 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 and then they're like, okay, this presentation or this speech feels done. And and 
and in that process they actually mapped it into a pattern but they never knew they did so story has an arc to it and I thought I think the greatest communicators use a shape but they just didn't know it and I remember I came into my office one Saturday morning and, and I drew the shape and I'm like oh my god I think I just made a discovery <laughs> and I cried because I thought if this is true it could be good used for good or it could be used for evil so it was this moment of feeling like oh my god what just did I do <laughs> and it was true it works and um, now I use this as an analysis tool in my talk I I, I analyzed Steve Jobs and Dr. King but I've I've um, also analyzed a ton of international speeches other types of speeches lectures I, I just analyze seemingly everything um, but it they do build a tension and release it and that tension and release is the gap between what is and what could be what currently is what could be and we're just creatures of contrast and you're creating contrast contrast and suddenly you're like wow what currently is is not appealing and what could be is very alluring when they can see it and that's what these great speeches do so so in effect are you saying that these great speeches make the ideas real to us uh, by creating these arcs and using the patterns and so forth is that accurate? yeah it it makes it clear uh, that we want to go there um, I, I think when we're imagining a future like you're presenting an idea and it doesn't exist yet most speeches are about a more utopian future so there is a gap and how you communicate is going to determine how much hope or how much uncertainty you're gonna they're gonna walk away feeling and if they can really clearly see the gap it makes them quite a bit more certain which gives them hope if they can't see the gap they're uncertain which will bring them fear so you want to make sure that the contrast is is clear enough that they're like I'm certain that this is the future we need to head toward so is PowerPoint good or, or evil? <laughs> <laughs> well Edward Tufte says it's evil Yet he does use it when he does his uh, conferences. So there was all this write-up about PowerPoint being evil, and it's hard. That's like calling a hammer evil. Now you can use a hammer to build a house, or you can use a hammer to hit someone in the head with it. And I think a lot of people use PowerPoint to hit people in the head. And I, I, I feel it's a communication issue because um, I actually think PowerPoint or Keynote or whatever the visual tool is you use is so important because if people can see what you're saying they can do what you're asking them to do they they can see it so visualizing and and also using it to um, evoke emotion or to create make an analytical point it's just I think it's an important tool so it's it's not evil I think the people who use it are uninformed about the visual display of information and its power because people come to hear you speak and and it's hard to point to a movement that didn't start with an impassioned speech so the spoken word is this ability we can connect I mean we just we had a hysterical time before the show started and that was all because of the spoken word but something happens when we put slides between me and you and it's like you know we make this barrier and and that's not good because people really do make decisions based on human connection so it's really how it's used um, that makes it good or that makes it evil. So, so Nancy, most of us don't have the, you know, the vision and the abilities of these great communicators that you describe. So, what <laughs> advice do you have to to the ordinary people like us who have to make presentations and really want to do a great job? What what can we do? You guys aren't ordinary. You're extraordinary. <laughs> well, I guess we're all extraordinary, but some people really. Have I get it. that. I get it. I get it all the time. Well, that's great, Nancy, but I'm just a middle manager, or I'm just normal. Could you tell me how like average people communicate? You know, like who wants to set their goal to average? You know, like nobody. Like if you look at the people I analyze, you could be like mm, Steve Jobs just a college dropout, Dr. King, just a preacher, uh, Avita Peron, just an orphan, just the different people whose lives I've studied, not qualified. I'm not qualified to be here. I dropped out of college and got a C- in speech communication for the one class I took in it. So so do I want to be normal as a communicator? No. So you, you need to study the great people, the great ones, and want to be great. So I feel like if if people had something they were passionate about, 
where they were like, I can barely sleep at night because I am so passionate about this thing, they will invest in their communication skills. So I think part of the problem is people maybe don't love what they do or they don't have something they care enough about to become the kind of phenomenal communicator that it takes to be really, really good. So I think, so I encourage people sometimes find a nonprofit that you can be so passionate about, it'll help you in your communication skills and you'll bring those skills into work. Because I don't, I don't want to, I don't want to be normal. Maybe there's a lot of people that do want to be average. Um, that's just not on my to-do list when I wake up every day. Sure. You, uh, one of your blogs, you had mentioned three keys to giving a solid presentation. One was, uh, you know, be audience-centric. Second was understand your role in the presentation, and third was wrap your content into a story. Can you talk a little bit about these three elements? Yeah, um, I think that goes to the empathy architect part um, that I was kind of starting off with a bit. So um, you'll have the three of them were um, really understanding your audience and understanding your role. So understanding the audience is that we need to be architects of empathy. We really need to know who we're talking to because the principle of resonance in in physics is that if you send a signal out and it hits another object at its resonant frequency, it will move. Hmm. But it's its resonant frequency. I have to send I can send signals out all day, but if I don't hit you with something that resonates, you won't be moved. So how are you going to know what moves people unless you spend time obsessing over what they care about, where they hang out online, what's on their mind, how do they what's a day in the life in their shoes look like? Those kinds of things. And then you know, anthropologically study them and understand them. As far as the role of the presenter goes, that was one of my big insights when I studied stories, especially when I started st studying Carl Jung and his archetypes, because I went into it with a mindset that the, um, the presenter is the hero, because a lot of times you're speaking a lot, so it feels like you're the central figure of the story, or at least of the scene in the story, and I realized pretty quickly that the audience is the hero. Um, the audience is the one that determines if our idea lives or dies. So we are dependent on them successfully understanding the idea or, or our dreams go unrealized. And so uh, it, it forces the presenter to approach their communication from a stance of humility and not one of arrogance or pride. Um, and then wrapping it in story, um, it's sometimes the things we have to communicate are, are a bitter pill because people want to stay where they're at. They want to stay in the status quo. They want to stay in this steady state. So when we're trying to get them to move, and especially to move forward, sometimes it's like a bitter pill. And, and I believe story is that fine coating, that sweet, slick coating around the pill that helps people um, ingest it better, helps people absorb it better. And um, it is a communication device that's, that goes back as far as we can tell that yeah. is a container of information that people can recall and retell. So those are those three things um, isn't in it that, true that Isn't it true that if, as you widen the gap between what is and, and what yeah. could be, that you will naturally see more resistance, mm -hmm. and, and and is that why you need to you know be adaptive and 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 iterate through a process where people can you know follow the journey to, to what it could be? The That's a great question. Yeah. So your net your your immediate next piece of communication always has to uh, make them feel with some sort of certainty that that gap can be reached, and um, uh, it motivates them. They need aspirational stories to help them get through the oppositional seasons. So yeah, it's really hard to. Um, it, it's really hard to communicate in a way that gets everyone on board. There'll always be resistors. And and that's part of what you need to put into your talk, into this story structure, is how are they going to resist? Because if you thoughtfully consider how everyone else is going to resist and you plant that insight into your talk, it'll minimize the amount of resistance and minimize, minimize the friction and it'll help you get traction quicker. If you just call a spade a spade and really empathetically let them know, I realize this is how you're feeling. I realize I promised you we wouldn't do any layoffs or, you know, and I'm really, I feel really terrible about this because I know that this is hard for you and you're sad, right? When was the last time an executive said something like that, you know? And um, it's really understanding where they're at in your moment of communication. So, so then great communication in a sense has this mixture of honesty, passion, and empathy. Yeah. 
Yeah. I think empathy breeds the, the honesty and passion. Um, but yeah, yeah, I like that. You would have to have a high degree of what situational awareness to be able to anticipate where resistance may yeah. come from and how you would, I think in one of your blogs or it was TED Talk, you talk about it's like sailing. And if you mm -hmm. can catch the wind, the velocity of the sail itself is ahead of the wind. It and goes faster than the wind, yeah. It goes faster than the wind. It's funny. I, you know, I'm like, I'm an empathy architect. Woohoo! No, I. <laughs> I'm probably the least empathetic person you'll ever meet. Oh, wow. I, I, I write books about it so I can learn how to do it for myself. And, um, you know, I've got to work on my own listening skills. I've had to come up with coping devices for that and, and all of that. So it, I would say this is very counterintuitive to me, and that's maybe why I'm pursuing it so passionately, is that I... I need it um, as a leader because I that's my biggest development area actually so I had to I had to actually come up with a system that my brain could operate within that that could help me um, as my coping mechanism to be more empathetic well you're obviously overly modest but aside from that can you share with us a little bit of that coping mechanism uh, for those of us who want Don't to learn how to do this better <laughs> Yeah, actually, it's a lot about what the next book is going to be about is, ha like, what happens in, in business is everyone wants to be an epic length tale. I don't think there's very many businesses that say, I want to expire in five years. You know, so if you're looking at the long view, wh what are the eras that are gonna you're going to have? And within those eras, every time there's these little episodes um, that make up this epic length tale. So everyone's within some sort of an episode and what is the narrative structure that you're taking everyone through so I can self-identify hmm I'm asking my employees to jump into the darkness I need to tell a story about sacrifice other times where we took risks and made it through oh wow we're in a season of opposition I could so you if you listen to kinds of stories the kinds of symbols are your employees not showing up to work till 10 a.m.? That's a form of protest. How do you listen to that and mm -hmm. say, I'm doing something wrong because they don't want to be here? And how do I address that and communicate that in a way that's empathetic toward them? So um, it's going to be, it's, it's a very interesting body of work. It's not, it's really more of a leadership communication and how to manage the narrative because if you don't c control the narrative of your own organization someone else will so it's really about how do you how do you become a narrator um, in your own organization and and create and curate the stories that are there already so it's steeped in empathy in that the stories and symbols and ceremonies are already in your culture. You need to pluck them out and re either redeem them or dismantle them. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know. It, it's an interesting piece of work, and and the structure still formulating in my head, as you could tell. But um, I I can see things more clearly now that I have this wayfinding device. But when you're as you're talking about it, doesn't it to to have this kind of empathy in communications, uh -huh. doesn't it also require the communicator to be open and yeah. flexible and adaptable to changing based on the messages that are coming back? Yeah. And, if that's, and if that's the case, then isn't a characteristic of great communicators being able to adapt and, and change? Yeah, I, I think that's a leader and communicator needs to be able to adapt, um, the, and the great ones can. And I think the ones that have a more epic length tale have been lead, led by people who are adaptive. And part of being adaptive is being able to read the signs. And a lot of those signs come to us through stories or symbols or ceremonies, different things that where the customers and or the employees are kind of crying out in a sense. You know, like, you're like, why does everyone keep bringing up this weird thing? Why is everyone obsessing over that? Well, that became a symbol for something that has a story or a sentiment that underlies it. So um, being able to hear and see uh, the kind of the cries of the people or the or the cries of the people sounds so dramatic but the um, the needs of the people on the customer and the employee side are what make peop make companies endure sure so I'm always nervous before I have to give a presentation or or, or, or 
tell a story, and um, I, I haven't really found a way to overcome that anxiety. And I read advice that you shared about calming nerves, and I believe it's from Dr. Nick Morgan, and, mm -hmm. and he said what you need to do right before you go on stage is to think about someone that you love dearly, mm -hmm. and that the feeling of affection calms your body and, and, and stops the stage fright. I, I haven't tried that, but it do you have advice, and I will try that, but do you have advice in terms of, you know, folks that have great ideas and they want to share those ideas? Oh, we're having a technical thing happen here. I can't hear them. I think Michael went away. I don't know what's going on here. I can't tell. Um, I'll just answer the question. Can you guys give me a thumbs up or thumbs down? Can you hear me? Oh, we you have a me? power outage. Okay. I, I thought that was happening. Can you hear us? It's um, dark. I can hear you. Okay, this entire building has a power outage. And we have battery power, and for some reason the network is still up. And so oh, cool. we have just on the fly changed technologies, and now we're back, and uh, let's go. Okay, we're talking about nerves. And this Why? I'm so nervous. <laughs> I'll keep going, I guess. That's, that's awesome. Fail to technology. So yeah, I literally what's happening is when you're scared, it's the fight or flight instinct. And it's telling you that you're going to walk out into a threatening environment. You've told yourself this is a threat and your body is adapting to that. So part of that mentalization exercise of thinking of someone you love actually is changing the chemistry in your body. Um, another thing that I do is I, I breathe really deep and calm. I use kind of some yoga and breathing techniques um, to calm myself down. But it, it actually is a physical phenomenon and it's real. And um, that's why you, you have to figure out an exercise or a mental scene that you paint in your mind that actually changes the chemistry in your body. You know, I just have to say, it's amazing to me, and it's like the two of us were like sitting in the dark. <laughs> you uh, look I'm, great. Uh, I'm absorbing all this all right. brilliant stuff, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> I'm going to use it in my next presentation. So. All right. Well, uh, so Nancy, a lot of the people that we have on this show are senior executives, C-level executives. Um, Oftentimes, they're chief information officers who come from a technology background rather than a communication yeah. background. And I think that their, their presentation skills are usually pretty good, but, they, but at a broader level, they need to establish relationships across their company with other, other executives and other departments. And in some cases, that's where their communication abilities may break down. So what advice do you have for uh, senior technical executives, or it could be middle managers as well, who want to communicate better to people in some other parts of the company? Yeah, I think a lot of the kind of engineering, financial analysts, and um, people in IT, they are more analytical in nature. So being dramatic and a storyteller sometimes feels like, wow, that's not um, natural. That, that You could actually lose your credibility if you try to come across in a way that's not genuine. So I really feel like that you need to stay genuine and stay your true self. That said, um, to be appealing to a broader audience outside of your own peer group, sometimes IT people, they can use jargon, they can use language that if they're talking to their own peer group makes sense, but to a broader audience will alienate you. So you have to really look and make an inventory around what's the language you're using that might not have broad appeal? How do I connect deeply to people who don't understand this technology? And for some, it feels like dumbing it down. But if you're talking broadly, that's kind of what has to happen because we're not specifically in the niche that you're talking about. So adding a thinner layer of emotional appeal is still important, but it doesn't have to be completely this massive amount of emotional appeal because then you would come across as uh, disingenuous. Another uh, TED Talk speaker like yourself, uh, Simon Sinek, uh, talked about, you know, all of us know what we do, some of us know how we do it, but only a few of us communicate why we do what we do. Um, advice to chief marketing officers and, and brand advocates in terms of how we can 
uh, empathetically and authentically tell our story and, and help grow uh, you know, our brand relevance. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I grapple with whose job is it to take story systemic. You know, you look at the brands that tell stories well, they are the greatest brands. And I feel like it is in many ways the CMO's job to train the organization or to create the need and the desire for everyone in an organization to become storytellers and to understand the power of story. And I think that that would wind up manifesting like it does at Nike, say, in, in the advertising, how employees talk about it. You could, you could get, go on the campus for just a tour of Nike and whoever's giving you the tour is a storyteller. So to take it systemic, I think, is somewhat in the job and role of the marketing department. Um, and that, but I also feel just in general, all the leaders need to understand, obviously, empathy. Um, and ha and uh, it's going to be interesting because there's been so many seeds planted around story in leadership. There's a, it's, a, it's on HR core competency list, storytelling, but nobody really knows what that means. They know they need it, but they don't know how to implement it. And it would be great because CMOs naturally have their head around it more than most to, to grasp those initiatives and push them through the organizations. Uh, Shell Israel, who's a Forbes contributor uh -huh. and an author of a new book about contextual intelligence, just tweeted, how about letting your customers control the narrative um, as well as your brand? And certainly in this social knowledge sharing world that we live, um, probably not a good, good idea to think you can control a brand. Uh, given the fact that the share of voice is, you know, with Facebook and Twitter and yeah. Instagram and Vine, you know, every employee represents the brand uh, in a way. Yeah, I think I think those tools are examples of listening devices. If you're not listening to the voice of the customer up there, th in many ways the customer does drive the brand because it, they can shout something out, it can go viral on social media channels, and then the company adapts. So um, those are definitely listening devices. As an organization, though, I think you have to know which ones are spikes in sentiments and which ones are real sentiments because you. It's very interesting how skewed social media data can become. You know, they, it can go up a vein and swirl up and it's like, well, that's not really the sentiment, really. It was just one phenomenon and sometimes these brands will react to a phenomenon instead of staying true to their core purpose. So it, it's both. You, you listen and then you have to apply some wisdom uh, to those voices too. You know, I, I work with quite a number of enterprise software companies and it's oftentimes their, their marketing organization that I work with. And these companies that sell similar products, whatever, pick a, pick a product category, very often the, from one company to the next, what they're saying just sounds so much alike. You know, company <laughs> yeah. A, company B, and company C, it all sounds the same. And so how can these folks get out of that rut? It's funny, I, we, because, you know, part of what we studied for the next book was we studied movements, because movements are moving people en masse, and that's a lot about what brands do. We studied expedition, because that's about moving people en masse in a dangerous situation, and so we did this parallel structure of all the people that are going into the cloud, or they're claiming to be the cloud company, and we put them all in parallel structure, and we were like, it all sounds just the same. We were hoping one would stand out and it all sounded the same. And um, I think being different is so important and um, when everyone's rushing like a little gold rush like what the cloud is, I think they're just they're staking a claim. They're just trying to drive their flag in the ground and stake a claim and, and the, it's going to be a real struggle for one of them to win because it's so cloudy. So it's very important. When w My kind of moment of differentiation came out when Good to Great came out. Jim Collins had his uh, hedgehog concept which said if there's one thing you can do, be best in the world at and be passionate about, do just that one thing. So it's the dot-com crash. The economy is just woo coming down, just like barreling. And I decide to shutter our firm from three other services that we did outside of presentations. We decided we would do just presentations. Total counterintuitive move. But that sacrifice that I had to make of these other services is what made us stand out. So it, it's definitely a principle that every organization needs to live by. So, uh, 
Oh, the power. <laughs> Let there be light. <laughs> partially, it's partially come back. It was kind of nice to be better lit than you guys, since you guys were better lit for the first half of the. <laughs> and, and it's better for you to be. You're in the light, and we're in the darkness, <laughs> as it should be. Well, we usually are. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> So, okay, for some personal advice that I'm seeking here, last year I attended a conference called Business Innovation Factory, uh, led by Saul Kaplan, and he invited 30 some odd storytellers, and they gave 15 minute tech talk like uh, presentations. I mean, unbelievably inspiring. Wow. Goosebumps, chills on my back. It was the two, two, the, the two most wonderful conference days that, that I've had in, in recent memory. Somehow or another, I was invited to present this year at uh, Business Innovation Factory 10. It's a 10th year anniversary, and I have 15 minutes. I have no idea what story I'm going to share and how I'm going to approach this this challenge. Any any advice that you can that you could give me? Because every day I'm thinking about it, and as it, as it gets closer, and it's in September, um, I'm getting more and more nervous. Yeah, it, it's interesting. I don't know if they're business stories or personal stories, but a, a, a personal story told with conviction is better than telling any third person story you could tell. And the weird thing about storytelling is it does require that you reveal that you're flawed. And I think that's why people, they know they need story, but nobody wants to be like, I'm, I've made a mistake or I entered into this perilous thing and it was a struggle but it, it's the human transformation it's observing transformation where they're rooting for you to do it well that's what we love about story so you have to have to display how you were changed or how someone else was changed through this story or how a technology was changed it is about change so you have to display that in some way that's amazing and and it's funny because um, we talk about these storytelling moments in the next book and um, Durkheim calls it collective effervescence. He was an anthropologist who talked about this moment. It's almost this spiritual moment where you're like, oh my God, I'm so connected to the speaker and, I'm, and I feel this sense of the people around me because we shared this moment that will never happen again ever. And collectively we all experienced some this emotional ride and it, and it is something that's very special. So um, that, it's really about your transformation. So you need to make that super, super clear. So, so what's the role of vulnerability in communication and storytelling then? I think people that are more self-aware are stronger communicators. Like I will follow a leader that's failed and talks about it before I'll follow a leader that pretends they've never failed. And I think that um, that's part of the transparency, the vulnerability, the part that makes us real. Yet. Um, I know, especially for women who are trying to make their way forward, it's hard to it's hard to say, "Oh my God, I'm so flawed." <laughs> you know, in an environment where it's competitive, people would stab you in the back for being flawed. All those kinds of things. So, um, there's a handful of communicators that are doing it well, um, but it's hard. It's a pra it's a practice and a discipline um, with some you know mystique and artistry in it. Um, so. Um, it's work. It's hard work, and some people want to put the work in, and some don't. Um, just because people like Mr. Jobs came across as an effortless communicator, it was six weeks of hard work, full time, to get ready for these presentations and have everything seamlessly work and the right demos in place, and that's a lot. But that was a strategy. That was their strategy: was to market the products by having everyone wait with bated an anticipation for this big keynote event. Um, so it all, it, it, I mean, it's all relative. Who are some of uh, today's great storytellers that, that you admire and, and, and that you learn from? That's interesting. And there's storytellers, and then there's people who are good business communicators. And um, it's hard to follow Steve Jobs. You know, there, there's a bit of a gap. Um, on the female side, I think that Sheryl Sandberg is giving it a go, and I really loved her TED Woman talk. Um, so that's kind of the public side. I think one of the dreamiest uh, communicators I could sit at her feet forever is the CEO of uh, Pepsi, Indra Nooyi. I think she's a brilliant, brilliant, uh, <laughs> just brilliant communicator, how she frames what she's talking about. Um, I actually think Benioff is super 
super good. He's the Salesforce.com CEO. Um, I love how a lot of his talks make it feel like Salesforce is doing something greater, um, greater good um, for the world. And I would give a um, hat tip to Scott Harrison of Charity Water. I think he's one of the greatest storytellers uh, ever. And um, so he's possibly at the top of my list. You know, Mark, uh, talking about Salesforce, Mark Benioff, when he gives these talks, especially over the last couple of years, couple of years, yeah, he will go on for like two or three yeah. hours, and he they're will, a little long. <laughs> they're long, but he goes through the audience, yep. and he's talking. He doesn't have. I mean, there's slides that are displayed, but there's they're no uh, setting. They're his no setting, general. his backdrop, yeah, and and he mixes it up so he does all the forms of contrast that are important. He brings other people up on the stage. He transitions quickly between talks. He's there amongst the people. It doesn't feel like there's this massive, massive hierarchy where he's up here and we're down here. You know, he he does a lot of things right um, in his talks, and I and there's been a dramatic improvement, I would say, in the last two to three years. Um, so I I I. I I feel like he's done a good job mastering his craft. We had John Hagel, who's the chairman of the Centers for the Edge at uh, Deloitte. And when he was on CXO Talk, uh, John made a distinction between stories and narratives. Mm -hmm. He mentioned that stories have a beginning, a middle, and an end. But narratives are more open-ended and more right. inclusive of the audience. So right. he thought there's more power in terms of communicating your message shaped as a narrative versus a story. Do you yeah. yeah, the the narrative is your meta story. That's the bigger narrative of which stories, symbols, ceremonies create that. Um, so it is a bigger um, it is a bigger, more endless narrative if and your narrative will be an epic tale length narrative. Um, if you have a purpose, if you have a universal purpose that you've created that is kind of the moral of the story of this grander narrative, it's the purpose of the story, the why we exist story, if that's amazing, you're crafting a narrative that supports that. So yes, um, narrative is the um, meta story. And, and what about this notion of connecting our personal story or the story that we're telling about our topic or our company to broader social good, social movements and so forth exactly uh, like Mark Benioff does. How do you do that in such a way that the audience believes that it's credible and real? I, and I don't know that your story has to always um, connect to social good to to bring a sense of purpose but um, that said if you have personal stories that do that there's I stories like I had this experience there's we stories we went through this thing there's they stories hey they did this so you can find stories a I a we or a they story that that t that supports the point you're trying to make so not everyone's point is going to be let's save lives in Africa though a lot of people's point should be that it might be you know something completely different like apples I would say is let's make something beautiful that people enjoy I would say their narrative is around pleasure or beauty and not so much let's go save lives and la 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 right but it still this feels like they have a greater sense um, of of purpose um, you know a, a greater quest of narrative may be health and well-being or it may be you know there's all kinds of other things that it could support um, but like I said I think a personal story told with conviction is so powerful and hopefully we're all doing something with our lives that supports a greater narrative because I think that's what brings meaning in our lives you know we're walking along in our lives we go through this thing and and we're like oh I, as a coping mechanism it's like okay I can cope with this hardship because I live on behalf of a greater narrative and I think everyone's looking for that that grand narrative that we can um, have our own story support now, um Let's say you're preparing for a keynote, um, and can you talk to us about your ritual in terms of <laughs> verse for the keynote? Uh, do you have sticky notes? Are you typing on slides? And yeah. how, how do you prepare yourself to 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 deliver? A great question, Vala. That's a great question. Great question. <laughs> 
guys. <laughs> I, I spend time, like it's funny, I, I spend time thinking about the audience. I'll go up and research previous events I spoke at. I'll go look at the Twitter feed, see what the feedback was. I mean, I spend a lot of time thinking about it and then how do I map um, to what they may want to hear. So I, I do have a little sticky note ritual. I, have, I do it in slide sorter mode, so my sticky notes are a lot of times slide sorter mode so I could look at the whole picture of what I'm trying, um, trying to communicate. Before I talk, I, the night before, I rehearse. The day before, a lot of people go in a green room, and if, if where I speak has a green room, first thing I say is, is it for chatting or for rehearsing? And if there's people in there like, ah, oh my god, it's so good to see you. I, I can't do those kinds of activities before I talk. I have to, I go into this mindset zone where I have to actually be alone and, and envision the talk and envision, I do a lot of kind of visualization exercises to make sure that I, that I nail it. Because I'm, I'm like the presentation lady, so like the pressure on me is so much more than the pressure on other people. I can't screw up. Yeah. So you stay, so you stay, you try to focus. That's Ab your Absolutely. Order. I have to clear out all the noise, focus, focus, focus. And then the minute it's over, I'm like, the friendly Nancy again. But before I'm, uh, you know, I'm not mean or anything, but I'm like, is there some place I can go where I can be alone? Because all this chatter is distracting me from the purpose of me being there. Awesome. And you, I mean, you revealed personal information. It was emotional. It was inspiring. How many times did you give the TED talk before you officially gave the TED talk? So I could. It was breaking up a little bit. How many? How many times? What about my TED talk? How many, how many times? Vala was asking. How many times did you give your TED talk oh. before you as practice? How did you prepare for your TED talk? Yeah, that was really high stakes. So I believe the amount of time you spend on something is proportionate to what's at stake. So it's like that's a big that's a big thing. Um, so it's had a million views. I don't know what Ted did, but it had a million views. Then they updated the website. Now it has like a half a million views. But there's about three hundred views, three hundred thousand views on uh, YouTube also. So high stakes. So I knew if I did a really good job, it could go viral, which it did, and built the business. So for me, CEO, super busy. I spent possibly around 200 hours on that talk. 38 of it was in rehearsing. So I filmed myself. I had a coach be like, hey, you're eight minutes over. I suggest you trim here and here, or eight seconds over, or whatever. And um, and I had to finish in 18. I mean, you can't. I'm the presentation lady. I had to finish in 18 minutes. So I was like, oh my God. I was like, I'm done. Thank you very much. I look up and it was six seconds left on the clock. I'll never forget. I was like, oh my God, I did it. But it was about 30 hours of just genuine rehearsal. And the rehearsal process is interesting because at first you, you're kind of looking up, remembering what you want to say. You look like you're trying to memorize it. You look like you're trying too hard, you know, and then you hit this threshold where you bust through and then it comes across more conversational, more genuine, less rehearsed and contrived and breaking through to that point um, is the bulk of the work. Isn't it? We have a question from Twitter from Christopher Kelly and uh, I don't know the motivation behind the question, but he asks, are, are you an athlete by any chance? <laughs> It sounds like the, maybe it's the amount of discipline. Yeah, what kind of a focus, question is that? Yes. Focus, discipline, drive, and of course you're fit. But, but I, 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 don't, I, don't. <laughs> I, I could show you my flawed parts, <laughs> um, but not on not on video, probably not. Um, interestingly, um, I wouldn't say I'm an athlete, but I had a really uh, rough childhood and my coping mechanism was when there was chaos in my house and you know people beating each other up and stuff I would run I would I I would run not like flee I would literally go to the little playground down the street and I would just do laps and laps until I collapsed and then I would come back willing ready to deal and I think when you go through tough times and stories resolve this way you're either a victim or a victor that's a positive resolution plot or a negative resolution plot and I think even though I went through really tough times as a kid somehow I chose to be a victor and not a victim and so maybe that kind of pursuit of um, victory <laughs> comes through uh, the verb in my life mission statement is to conquer so maybe that's part of it um, just hired my first personal trainer. She comes to the house. It's awesome. So, <laughs> but I'm not an athlete. <laughs> That's awesome.
This, you know, the singer Suzanne Vega, I have this album, she gave a concert and somebody, and in the introduction of this concert as she's singing, she said, she was doing this radio interview and somebody called up and said, Miss Vega, I have a question for you and, and I don't think you've heard this question before. And she says, skeptic, she's skeptical, she says, well, you know, okay, what is your question? I, you know, I'm sure I've heard everything. And he says, if you could be a fruit or vegetable, what kind of fruit or vegetable would you be? <laughs> and it reminded me of asking you if you're an athlete, reminded me of... What, what an extraordinary reveal as, as a result of an answer to that question. So thank you very much for uh, sharing about how you cope and, you know, with um, adversity and, and it inspires you to be a better person and now we all benefit from it. So thank you. And, and Christopher Kelly actually comments uh, about his question, saying that it comes from sports psychology, and he was drawing the connection between the clarity that he sees in athletes and the clarity that you've presented during in your work and, and of course, in our conversation today. It's interesting. I think so many times life is fog. We were just I was just talking about that with my co-author and I think when it's foggy it's ambiguous and people won't commit and I think that's a lot of what my work is is trying to dissipate the fog so people can see. Um because if they can see what you're trying to do, they'll believe you and they'll go. I have you know we're we're just about out of time. Let me ask you one final question very quickly which is you mentioned before, as you were practicing uh, for your TED Talk, over time it became, it, 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 it took on the appearance of being less practiced and more natural and less studied. Can you just briefly talk about that paradox of practice yields less studied? Yeah. You know what, I, I, I think saying it over and over and over, you, you can actually see when someone's trying to pull it out of their brain, they kind of look up and, and they're trying to remember. And, and in some ways, TED Talks have become, you can see that. And, and you can see where they haven't quite spent enough time uh, thinking through um, what they're going to say. So, in, and you're like trying to recall, and it's kind of stilted, and then you're just like, I know it well enough and then you start to talk from your heart and you riff a little bit and, and you mix it up and then you're reading the people and you're responding to them instead of pull it, trying to pull it down from your head. So it's like, okay, I've practiced enough, I'm just going to say what I'm going to say naturally and, um, and, and, and there is a truth to that that when you speak more intuitively, more from here instead of here, you um, come across differently. And I think it's pulling it down into your heart. That's the heart. That's the hardest part. So you internalize it so high. It becomes a part of you. Right. It becomes a natural part of an extension of you, a natural, a natural piece of what you're trying to deliver on behalf of them, um, and not so much about you trying to think through what to say. Um, yeah. Okay. I. You know. I think we're just about out of time. I think we are out of time. This has been a very, very fast 45 minutes. Um, we've been talking with Nancy Duarte, who is truly one of the, she calls herself the presentation lady. You refer to yourself <laughs> that way. And what an understatement that is about the things that you have done and... You're so what, kind. What you're doing for all of us with your great expertise in sharing how to communicate. Yeah. Thank if you're you. If you're a marketeer or a business leader and you're not following uh, Nancy, reading her books and a new book that's coming out, and please watch her TED Talk because it is uh, incredibly insightful and, uh, and, and my, my highest recommendation. So thank you very much for uh, joining us uh, on a Friday afternoon. Thank you, guys. Now, next week, uh, which is July 3rd, I believe, there is... No CXO talk. Voila, this will be our first time not having a CXO talk in like almost a year. In a long time. We're breaking the streak, but we're celebrating uh, uh, and <laughs> we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back with, with force uh, following week. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, everybody, for watching. So, Voila, let's, instead of doing a handshake, let's do like a remote fist bump. Come on, come on. <laughs> there you go. And nobody can see except us. <laughs> Sure.
another 45 <laughs> session with a brilliant Nancy Dewar. But thank you very much. <laughs> all right, Nancy, all right, thank you. Right, there Nancy. we go. All right. Virtual fist bump. That's awesome. Okay. <laughs> Well, thank you so much and uh, to Nancy Duarte, and thank you, everybody, for watching. And tune in in two weeks from today, and we'll look forward to seeing you again. Bye-bye.